Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sam Lundgren. I'm the director of the Policing Institute for the Eastern Region at Anglia Ruskin University. I'd like to welcome you to the first of our 2021 research seminars. Um, the aim of this series is to create a space really to um, for policing practitioners and academic colleagues to come together and hear about research that's going on across the university in areas relevant to um, crime and policing. Uh, this is the first event that we've held online um, and um, it's there's been a lot of hard work going on behind the scenes, but what we hope by hosting these online for the foreseeable future is that it makes these events much more accessible to those who have perhaps wanted to come in the past but haven't been able to get to our Chelmsford campus. It's actually really great to see on the um, the, the list of, of attendees today, uh, policing colleagues from across the Eastern region and academics across Anglia Ruskin, so um, that's fantastic. Um, while I have a moment, I'd just like to thank both Carla and Winnie who have worked really hard behind the scenes to um, make this possible um, and hopefully it will go without too many hitches. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, what I'd like to do is just give some detail around how the event, these events are going to run. We have an, uh, about an hour. Presentations will usually last for about 45 minutes. There will be usually be opportunities for questions and answers. Unfortunately today um, we are not able to uh, provide that facility but I know that our speaker is happy to take questions or feedback um, via email afterwards but we will certainly have that capability um, working for future uh, presentations. Um, so our speaker today is Nima Trevedi Bateman. Nima's background is in psychology and uh, criminology with a particular interest in developmental psychology. She completed her PhD in 2014 at the Institute of Criminology at Cambridge University, where she also managed the research team for the longitudinal um, Peterborough Adolescent and Youth Development Study. She's currently course leader and for our very own criminology and criminology and sociology degree pathways at Anglia Ruskin. And I'm really delighted that she's here with us today to kick off our research seminar series, talking about her research on the role of empathy, shame and guilt in persistent violence. So without further ado, and hopefully with the magic of technology, I'll hand over to Nima. Thank you. Hi everybody, it's good to be here with you all. Thank you for joining me and thank you to Pierre for inviting me today to share my research with everybody. So if you just bear with me for a moment, I'm just going to pull up my slides here so that everybody can see them. Sam or Winnie, are you able to just confirm if you can see the slides okay? Okay, just bear with me a moment, everybody. Just trying to get those slides pulled up so that you can see them. Fantastic. I think um, I think you can you can see them. OK, so I think what we might do is. Perhaps, um, oh, that's it. So we're going to try and get them, try and get them shared for you in a moment. OK, fantastic. So I think the um, our message is that everybody can see the slides. So that's great. I can get started. Thank you, everyone. OK, so today we're going to talk about all things um, morality related. And my focus, my core objective for today really is to um, 
offer a build the case for why I think weak morality is really, really important when it comes to understanding why crime occurs. And further to that, important for today is what we can actually do about that and how we can use that in society to try and perhaps implement programs or interventions or outreach of some sort with people. My research is, um, is primarily based with young people um, to attempt to strengthen morality um, through various different sources. So that's the core objective for today. And the work that I discuss, much of it is published in, um, in the references on the first slide here. So um, please feel free to take a, take a, take a look at that. So I promised that I would be talking about the, my uh, qualitative interviews. So I carried out 50 interviews with um, a violent offender subsample, and they were participants in the Peterborough study that Sam mentioned a moment ago. So we, at that time, we had known them. They're a part of this longitudinal study, the PADS Plus study, and we'd known them for some time um, at that point, for, for about eight, 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 ten years or so. And I chose 50 of the most violent in the sample uh, based on their past self-reported crime data. And I sat down and I had really long and detailed discussions about the last time that they um, were involved in an act of violence. And within that, I captured a lot of information about how they felt about whether it was right or wrong and the associated emotions attached to that, such as empathy, shame and guilt. I asked them about uh, various other characteristics about the setting itself, the location, who was there, um, intoxication, injuries and so on. And I used that to build a picture of um, how it, there, see, there seems to be an overwhelming conclusion from this, which is that those with weak morality that spend time in settings with particular characteristics are far more likely to be involved in crime events. Um, and I can show you some of this data during the course of the next 50 minutes or so um, to try and um, help us get towards the point that we want to be at, which is how can we go out and actually disseminate this and make some sort of impact in some way and make some changes. So what I found was that not only do young people not think it's wrong to commit the acts of crime, but they also have weak levels of the emotions attached to those. And um, what we can do is we can think about how that can make an impact based on um, various different mixed methods. So what I did was this qualitative interview data that I'm describing, I also corroborated it with questionnaire data quantitative data, and that was longitudinally co collected. So it was from a large sample, about 700 young people in Peterborough, across their early adolescence, mid and late adolescence. And it was a really rare opportunity. One, and the, stud the longitudinal studies um, of this kind and um, with this level of detail are very rare. So I'm in a fortunate position to be able to analyse that and build the case that I'm looking to make. And I should mention here that all of the uh, theoretical underpinning here is uh, based on the situational action theory perspective of crime, um, which essentially models morality as one of the core primary factors in, um, in causing, um, causing crime. So firstly, I think it's important for us to start with, an, uh, with a definition of morality that I'm using. So there are various different definitions of morality. Um, for some, it has a religious connotation. For some, it involves um, the way that their parents or caregivers modelled appropriate behaviours. For some, it's to do with who you spend time with in peer groups and friendship groups. In the fields of psychology and criminology, it's very much modelled as a um, as a rule based um, initiative, and the emotions attached to that, like I mentioned earlier. So we're we're viewing breaking moral acts 
as breaking acts as defined by the law, so essentially breaking the law. So when we mention strong morality, we're referring to law-abiding acts or refraining from breaking the law, and um, the opposite applies to. So when we mention weak morality, we're not necessarily making a judgment of good and bad people, which it can be confused for sometimes, but instead we are defining it very much with the law. Um, and so weak morality equates to breaking of, um, of laws and the acts that are defined by that. And then attached to that, we should really make it clear what we mean by empathy, shame and guilt as well. So these are all um, psychological constructs and um, the idea is that there's a pathway here by which empathy is required in order to be able to feel guilt and shame and those really are the emotional pulls that, that regulate our behaviour, especially when provoked or pushed or in positions of conflict in a certain way. So empathy, very much defined as being able to see um, the viewpoint of somebody else. It can be affective empathy and cognitive empathy. So being able to feel emotional congruence with how someone else, and in this case, victims usually might feel. And the other is just being able to identify the cognitive aspect, being able to identify how someone else feels. And these constructs have been really largely neglected in criminological research. So historically, in the explanation of crime, the, uh, the, the school of thought has been to take a rational, kind of deliberative, kind of uh, decision making uh, approach, which is, um, you know, a cost and benefit analysis of the pros and cons of, of carrying out a certain action, which is quite a procedural way of looking at things. But actually, emotions play a role in our everyday actions, whether they be crime actions or moral transgressions. So it would be, it would be largely unrealistic to believe that emotions don't play a role in our behaviours, especially when crimes and violence in particular um, often have an emotional element, a social element or a communicative element of some sort, relationships with others. So moving on to guilt and shame, the difference between those, guilt is often defined as a negative feeling which is expressed um, inwardly towards oneself. Whereas shame, on the other hand, can be defined as, again, a negative feeling, but often experienced either in the consideration of or in the presence of others. So it might be a close family member, a parent, a partner. Um, and, and so taken together, the argument here is that all of these characteristics need to be well developed and well developed um, from the early years. So the approach that I take, and I guess, the key take home message for today is that I think the utility of my work is in addressing how we can get to the early primary socialization agents. So that, that from a very early age. So in the first instance, that's parents, parenting style, moral teachings, and the, the role modeling of the moral behavior of the parent to the child. Then it moves on to the school years, um, and this may be something that um, that we can pick up on outside of the session in terms of um, any work that's going on, um, practitioners, police officers that are present today, um, liaising with schools and working with um, people in schools to try and build that strength of morality and introduce tools and tasks and activities um, to build those attitudes that are, that are really required in order to um, build this moral outlook that's required um, to, um, to, 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 to fail to see crime as, an, as a good available alternative for action. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about definitions now, so hopefully you have some idea of the context of the kinds of terms that I will use. And here are some excerpts from those interviews that I mentioned right at the beginning. So um, in terms of shame, guilt, empathy, no, I was totally focused on one thing and one thing only, ashamed or guilty the, um, the next day. There's not much guilt involved in the whole situation, to be honest. Empathy, if he hasn't got the feelings of not hitting me, it shouldn't be the same the other way around. Um, as far as I know it, no one my age thinks about that kind of stuff. 
And I think that really gets to the bottom of, um, or that serves as a really good example of the kind of feeling that was uh, translated and transferred across these 50 interviews with prolific and um, frequent violent offenders. So the, the model that I am working with here is that we start with empathy. So taking the second row here, if the ability to exercise empathy isn't there because it hasn't been developed adequately throughout the early years and adolescent years, um, then we find it more difficult to be able to feel the shame or the guilt. Because to be able to assess the impact of somebody's action on somebody else, on a victim or on society or anyone else, we need to be able to first see things from other people's points of view. And then attach to that, if I also don't think it's wrong to commit the action in question, to, to respond to someone pushing past me in a, in a pub um, with violence instead of walking the other direction or just frowning and walking away. If I don't think it's wrong to respond violently when provoked in that sort of example, and I don't feel the emotion, then the idea here is that crime is likely, much more likely to be seen as a, as a course of action. So if, at this point, if I could just um, give a little bit more background to this, this idea, it's, it's very much simplified here. Um, and for, for, for the time that we have today, I think it presents uh, relatively neatly the point that I'm trying to get across. But actually what's happened is this, idea has been tested now in many countries around the world and hundreds of peer-reviewed publications have been presented on this um, and if you want if you want to find any of those then you can do a search for situational action theory testing and that's where you find all of those papers um, so this is something that has been modelled and replicated many times and a group of us researchers that are working on this topic really feel that we have found the key to unlocking one of the core core um, uh, precursors to, to involvement in crime and in particularly involvement in violence in this case. So let me talk you through the four main questions that I want to kind of present to you today. Um, and it follows the model in the sequence that I just mentioned. So firstly, is everything that I just said found to be true? And is it qualified by the data? So first, is empathy even required for the shame and the guilt to be felt? And when we compare two samples, so we can compare the violent subsample of 50 young people that I mentioned earlier on, versus the other participants in the PAD study, so that's about another 160 uh, sorry, 650 participants. When we compare them, can we see significant differences in their moral emotions, in their moral rules? And number three, can these issues, the, these factors that, I, that I'm proposing are important, be used to predict violence involvement? Because if they can, then again, we're onto something here and we need to start translating this into, into practice. And finally, I talk about how there is actually a real difference by looking at one very nuanced detail. And that is, I'll give, I'll, if you'll allow me to give the spoiler uh, now, it's that those with weak moral emotions and weak moral rules, so remember that's weak shame, empathy and guilt, and they really don't think it's wrong to commit the act they're far more likely to report a high number of crimes and significantly high number of crimes than if they have weak uh, moral rules and um, a moderate moral emotion. So what we're saying here is that the two are really important together in interaction, both the moral emotions and the moral rules, which is really important because some of you might be familiar with crime prevention programs, crime initiatives that again have focused on, uh, have ignored this, um, the input of the emotion and have focused more so on uh, what's going on in terms of the analysis of the situation, which is again portrayed to be slightly more rational um, and slightly more kind of um, planned and deliberate. So this is these are the four questions that I will attempt to unravel now over the course of the next sort of 10-15 um, minutes or so. So firstly, is empathy required for the shame and the guilt? So 
I have only included the numbers here uh, in case we have any quantitative researchers amongst us in the audience, but otherwise it, it's absolutely not necessary to, um, to absorb that information unless it's of interest to you. But I can talk you through the reason that I've put this on here. So we find that yes, empathy does significantly um, predict whether shame and the guilt is reported. So that means that there's a correlation between the two. So if there's weak empathy, shame and guilt is likely to be weak. If there's stronger empathy, shame and guilt is likely to be stronger. So that's relatively straightforward and builds the first portion of my case. Next, we want to look at whether there's a difference in these key constructs between the violent sample and the rest of the sample, which contains moderate uh, offenders, moderate seriousness or severity or frequency, and those that don't commit um, crime, those that haven't reported crime. And if you'll allow me to just unpick um, what's going on here on this slide, what I've done here is I've split the, um, the, the participants in the study by four moral emotion categories, and that's shame and guilt. So those in the weakest moral emotion categories report very weak shame and guilt, and those in the strongest moral emotion category report very strong shame and guilt. And you can see this presents a really neat uh, pictorial illustration of, of what I'm trying to get at here. We, and if we just take the violence subsample in, in the first instance, so we look at the red bars, you can see that about 67 crimes, are self, violent crimes, are self-reported on average across the 10-year period that we spent time with these young people um, for those that reported very weak shame and guilt. And as, you, as, the, we, as the shame and the guilt it gets slightly stronger as you go, as you head towards the right across the bar charts, you can see, well, if, they're, if they have weak moral emotion, they report self-report around 36 uh, violent crimes in that period. As it gets stronger, about 21. And then there aren't any uh, crimes reported in those who are in the strongest moral emotion category, which is why there's no bar there. So, the, and, and it's the same trend with the uh, with the rest of the sample too. So the rest of the sample are not the uh, prolific violent offenders. So that's why their their crimes are much lower. You can see because of the way they've been split. But the same trend is there. So you have the highest number of self-reported crimes for the weaker moral emotion categories. And you can see this, and again here, you really you just need to read across with me um, the, the figures in the box here. So this is just showing us the, the scores for each uh, construct compared for the violent sample versus the rest of the sample. So if you just read across along with me here now, for general empathy, the first row, they uh, on average report um, a score of 29 of a total of 51 if they're in the violent sample, but 34 for the rest of the sample. And then read along the following rows for shame and guilt and moral rules. And you'll see that it is always hi uh, higher in the rest of the sample. So those core measures that I'm interested in talking to you about today are much lower, significantly lower, which is why this table is here, in the in violent offenders compared to the others. So I'll move on to number three now. So now we're looking at whether these, it's all very well to say there's a difference between groups, but can we actually predict whether violence involvement will occur based on these shame, guilt and moral rules measures. Um, we find here that we can pre predict that. Um, so we can use guilt, shame and moral rules to predict the outcome of violence. However, oh, sorry, uh, forgive me there, we can use guilt and moral rules, but however, you can see that um, the shame drops off here. So I want to make a point here about shame and actually, this, the psychological research here um, indicates that the relationship between shame and uh, criminal behaviour, antisocial behaviour, may be slightly more complicated um, and need further unpicking than um, the relationship between guilt and moral rules. So that's something to think about a little bit more. But this here is using questionnaire data. And what I found in direct contrast with that, actually, was that in my 50 
in-depth interviews, my verbal interviews with, with the prolific violent offenders, shame didn't didn't feature at all and, and and participants were very vocal that they didn't feel the shame particularly because the majority of the, the violent events were carried out with their peers and if the peers set a moral context that that's that's reasonable and so so by that I mean that the peers don't think it's wrong and don't feel shameful for carrying out those particular acts then the young people themselves are less likely to feel that because it builds a, a, a low shame community, essentially, in that particular setting, in that crime event. So there are a few different um, interesting um, areas here that we can, we can try and unpick a bit further. And finally, this is what I was mentioning uh, earlier on about, um, about the trends that we find here. So we've got uh, crime frequency over a four year period um, on the, on the y axis here. Um, and you can see that what I'm trying to show is that it's when you have weak moral rules and weak moral emotion in young people that they report over 100 crimes um, over the four year period. But when the moral emotion and the moral rules are strong or even medium, we're looking at far lower figures. You can see the highest there is, is 23 or something and then and then below. So again, this is another way of illustrating that um, the, the body of evidence is um, really quite convincing and quite compelling in terms of um, how the data shows when you're looking at a large sample of young people across a long period of time. So it isn't just a one-off um, meeting with a stranger asking them if they've committed crimes. And this is a good point actually to add that these self-reported crimes have been matched up with um, officially reported records as well. Um, and as you might expect, the, the there were a lot of self-reported crimes, or maybe I wouldn't say a lot actually, I don't have the figures on the top of my head, but there were more self-reported crimes than officially reported crimes, um, things that didn't go through into the into the um, official route. Okay, so so that that was kind of the, my first um, my first kind of batch of information that I wanted to get across today, which is that in summary, that the violent offenders they they report that they don't think it's wrong to commit the acts of violence and they don't care about it, and that's the really important part, and that that's made up of the empathy, the shame, and the guilt attached to how they feel about their action, and that what what's really important here and the thing to take away is that when everything is weak, when when the when the moral rule is weak, which is that they don't think it's wrong to commit the act itself and the attached emotion is weak, that's when we start to see that um, the overwhelming crimes seem to be occurring under those circumstances for those individuals. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, about the settings themselves, um, which will lead us on, hopefully, to a bit more of a discussion about what we can do with this information and how it can be of some use to all of us in society. So these are the four factors that um, that that really um, came to light that were commonly characteristic of the violent events, of the 50 violent events that I, that I interviewed about. So there was the presence of peers, presence of provocation, which has really interesting implications because research shows that those with a weaker morality, using the definition I've given today, are likely to have a higher sensitivity to reacting aggressively to provocation. And those are really interesting factors when they're put together because um, some of us, again, if we use the being pushed in a crowded pub example, some of us simply just wouldn't respond to that with violence, no, no matter sort of if, it, if it's a firm push or a light push. Or, and, and some of us have a lower sensitivity to provocation, which is in some ways attached to our inherent morality. Um, whereas Others who may have weak morality are more likely to have a higher sensitivity to those provocations. And we refer to that as um, development of habitual action in that eventually 
um, the young people um, that we spoke to would uh, would go out and, and, and expect to see violence as their only alternative in a habitual way without requiring that psychological deliberation of various different action options and reviewing each and every one, it becomes a habitual action to respond with violence. And I think that's a really important element to understanding this as well. Then, so those were the first two setting level factors um, that we identified. And then uh, next, the location being evening city centre and last, the consumption of alcohol. So um, uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, we have um, police officers um, in attendance in the audience today. So the information about the, the setting and the type of uh, violence itself may not be particularly novel or interesting, but I'm using this as a kind of base to take us towards where we need to get to, which is that certain types of people with weak morality are more likely to spend time in certain types of settings, like settings with the four features listed here. And it's that that we need to target in some way. And there's no easy answer to how we can do that. But I, I certainly have some ideas about how I think that could that could come into play that I'll come on to. So um, uh, of those 50 violent events, just to give you a picture of how they looked, almost half in pubs and clubs, um, the supervision and monitoring applies to uh, with things like um, a pub bouncer or, or a parent or a, um, a boss, for example. Um, provocation I already talked about a little bit. So you can see those percentages there are the percentage of the 50 events where those, those factors featured. So two thirds of the events, presence of peers, um, and uh, overwhelmingly most of the events not doing anything in particular other than socialising, which I think is another really um, key point to target. Because again, people with weak morality are more likely to spend their time not doing uh, structured activities, or rather I should say, they're more likely to spend a higher proportion of their time not in structured activities compared to others with um, stronger morality. And so that raises lots of other questions about how we can uh, start to tackle this as well. Um, I should say that a lot of my conclusions on um, the setting and the interaction with morality are built on a really cool innovative tool that's used with the PAD study, which is called the space time budget. And essentially what we did with these 700 participants several times across 10 years is we sat down and we took a four day diary of their lives and we tracked for, split down by the hour unit. So that's 24 hours times four. And for each unit, hour unit, we looked at where they were, who they were spending time with, what they were doing, and whether any crime events took place, um, whether they were children from school, whether there were any altercations of any kind um, with others. And so lots of these conclusions that I'm making are based on that data, which is um, which has been published um, elsewhere. So um, that's where the, the structured activity information comes from, some of it. So I'm not actually, um, I'm just looking at the time now, I'm not going to go into these uh, three case study examples, um, but uh, you can see that, uh, you can see the kind of characteristics of, of, the, of the events here. But the things that I just want to hone in on really are the reason I've put case study one up here is to illustrate um, that most of the events are, or two thirds of the events are carried out in the presence of peers, and that has implications for morality, for shame, for empathy, for guilt, um, and is an area that I feel should be tackled. This column on the right refers to my uh, 50 interviews. The co column on the left refers to that four day diary tool that I just told you about. Um, and it's just to say that it's when if the percentages add up to 100, or at least I hope they do. So very few crimes are occurring with family, at school, at work, um, and the majority uh, occurring um, in the presence of peers. Moving on to the next point that I want to make, here's another example um, of one of these 50 interviews. And here the issue is the alcohol, which again, doesn't necessarily come as a surprise. This isn't brand new information, but it does have implications for its interaction with uh, brain functioning. So the idea here very much that 
if we drink, um, if there's a certain moderate level of intoxication, it may encourage um, exacerbation of some of these emotions that we're talking about, empathy, uh, shame, guilt, positive feelings in some way, and dumbing down of some negative feelings in some way. But once that level of intoxication goes beyond moderate and moves towards severe intoxication, uh, the theory here and the backing here is that the, the shame and the guilt and the empathy and their moral rules in some ways go out of the window and are and plummet. So again, this the, the alcohol uh, information isn't news, but the consideration of how the common characteristics of the violent events interact with the morality and the moral emotion might be because there isn't enough of that out there um, in the in the arena. And then thirdly, um, the thing I want to talk about here is provocation, which I've already mentioned a little bit. Um, lots, lots of the interviews, uh, one of the core outcomes is that um, I didn't start it, but somebody either looked at me or pushed me or made a rude remark to me, as is the case here, um, or was, you know, too close to me, um, whatever it might be, or made a, psych a psychological remark. So again, I think it was something like 80, 80 something percent now, wasn't it? So most of the events, a lot of the events carried out um, with provocation. So this is, this is really where I want to head towards now. So really the, the the crimes are really really strongly concentrated and they lie with certain people so i think i'm right in saying there was something like four or five percent of the 700 young people in the pad study are responsible for almost half of the total hundreds and hundreds of crimes that were reported to us across the 10-year period so i'll just repeat that four or five percent of the 700 in the sample were responsible for almost half of the crimes reported across the 10-year period. So to me, that's really powerful. These are the people, the data shows, I showed you some of it, who have especially weak morality and especially weak moral rules. And these are the people that are more likely to spend time in settings with the characteristics that I just listed earlier on. And of course, there are many more characteristics, but I've, I've selected some, some highlights here that I think are worth noting. Um, so that, it, that's the question now. How do we tackle, how do we tackle this? Um, so my suggestion that I'll spend about five minutes talking to you about now, if that's okay, is um, that in my background is psychology, I am convinced from that huge, overwhelming amount of psychological evidence about how we develop in our early childhood, in our early years, um, and how we um, form our moral outlook, which directly informs our actions, that we need to tackle those primary socialization agents, as I call them. So that is the, um, the parenting style, the parenting modeling, the, the teachers, the level of morality education in a compulsory school system, for example, um, and it needs to happen consistently and from uh, from an early stage. And the research that I'm reading, I think, provides a convincing case that um, it's not too late later down the line to try and strengthen morality but that it's preferable for the morality to be developed using what I call those traditional sources, because actually most of us have a moderate to strong morality in the population. And like I said, with that figure about the pad sample there, we're talking about a minority of individuals here um, when we're talking about prolific and serious and uh, repeat frequent um, offending. So we have we had you know people in the in the in the study sample who have reported one or two crimes across the ten year period. It may be um, you know, minor minor shoplifting things like that, or or one scrap at school because they were going through a particularly tough time or something. But I think this applies really uh, well to uh, serious um, repeat violence. So and the second bullet point here I think is is really difficult to, 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 to tackle. The monitoring of where and how young people spend their time, by where I'm talking about um, those settings that are characterised by, uh, the set, the, by the characteristics I meant, 
um, mentioned earlier on, and by how I'm talking about the structured activity issue that I mentioned, um, which is why I, I am a really firm um, believer in um, the activity groups um, that are put on. So, for example, um, I've been working with um, Romsey Mill in Cambridge, who provide um, all manner of activities for um, for young people to take part in, whether it's sports or other activities of any kind. Um, and, and I've done some work for some other organisations that have provided especially sporting activities and they have quite a for, firm focus on um, just providing some sort of structure, a time to be somewhere and to meet people and to, to gather, uh, to have some sort of support network or community feel in some way, which is quite simply time when uh, people with weak morality are not, uh, are not given as open an opportunity to engage in these um, in crime events. So I, I, I would like to hear from, um, hear from you and in particular I know um, we've got, um, we, we were expecting to have um, police officers from various forces here with us. My email address is on one of the latest slides and I would be really happy and keen to um, pick up with um, people with any thought, thoughts that they have on how this can apply and how it links into your, your stream, your work streams and your, your channels of things that you're involved in. Um, if I can tell you a, a bit about um, something that I'm working on at the moment, I'm um, attempting to get some, some research funding to put this idea into practice. So my idea is that if we could start developing morality strengthening programs, and I'll explain what that might include in a moment, then it gives us or it gives us the opportunity to allow young people to build the psychological tools that are required for them to be able to make different choices when it comes to crime decision making. And that's as you can imagine, based on what I've said so far, strengthening the idea that things are right and wrong in certain situations and they have implications for, for all sorts of people, emotional and financial implications, uh, both personally and as a society, but also further to that, building the empathy, the shame and the guilt. And often that has uh, not developed fully because of, um, because of, uh, difficult relationships with um, family members, uh, primary carers and so on earlier in life is, is what the evidence indicates. So about rebuilding um, put perhaps those missed opportunities um, perhaps earlier in life. Um, and the idea here would be that we, we would seek to try and kind of deliver this program. So the idea that, that I have here is it would it would be maybe um, 10 sessions or so in 10 consecutive weeks. And each session would focus on building the, this morality strengthening and that we would be able to carry out some assessments of whether participants felt that there was any change in their moral outlook and whether there was any change in their actual reported antisocial and criminal behavior. And that's something that we'd be able to do relatively inexpensively um, in comparison to the cost um, that's, that's put into kind of pre preventative uh, measures and to be able to uh, ex assess that both short term and longer term um, in, in, in the long run to see whether we can create some long lasting effects because that is the idea here. It's about adapting cognitive thinking um, and behaviour for this habitual way that I mentioned earlier on so that it becomes less effortful to make uh, law abiding decisions. Um, so, I mean, I think I've already spoken about um, some of the information on this slide in terms of traditional sources of morality development. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the about what, uh, what I would suggest um, for the programme here. So um, tasks, role playing exercises, particularly as being victim and being offender and swapping um, debates, because uh, it may be, or at least uh, the hundreds of young people that I spent time with in Peterborough, their uh, view was very much um, that they were relieved to be able to talk to someone who wasn't necessarily reprimanding them for bad behaviour, but was seeking to try and understand more about their lives, essentially. And I think that, I, that a similar mentality would work here. So 
giving um, young people the chance to debate about why things are right and wrong and um, what, why it should be a certain way and to come to their own conclusions, but in a, in a facilitator-led way, essentially. Um, and other programmes that have been um, carried out in, in this, um, trying to test these sorts of information uh, interventions, looking at things like constructive decision making, being in the moment, uh, not getting carried away. So this is the idea with the mindfulness. Um, and then two things to pick up on here, peer resistance training. We talked about how most of the events are occurring in the presence of um, peers and the peer pressure involved. So trying to develop some peer resisting, um, resisting pressuring behaviours. And this idea of structured community very much really backs off the, off the, the issues I mentioned with uh, being in activities um, and having some sort of social community um, kind of element, which I assume is more important than ever at the moment with our limited face-to-face -face interactions. Um, so really, that's I think that's a, a kind of a, a good place for me to stop talking. You've been listening for some time now, but if I just finish by saying that on the right there is the um, the academic paper um, looking at this work, which goes into a lot more detail than I've covered today. And um, the, the book on the left, Breaking Rules, um, provides a, a lot more information even further to that. Um, and my email address there, I'm happy for you to note that down and to get in touch anytime. I'd be very happy to pick up um, outside of this session and, and talk some more. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Nima. Um, that was really fascinating. Thank you so much for um, kickstarting our seminar series um, it, it took, with such a flying start. I, I just obviously, unfortunately, as we don't have opportunities for questions, and I'm sure there are plenty from the audience, but um, I just have a couple um, to ask you, if I may. Um, one in particular, you mentioned earlier, obviously, younger is better for um, starting these sorts of things. Um, I'm just wondering how morality, um, does it tend to remain consistent or if there is someone has weak morality, does it tend to remain consistently weak across the life course or, are, you know, does it does it fluctuate and change? Or are you really and how 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 late how late is too late too late? Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question. Um, if you see me glance down, I'm not switching off, I'm just jotting down some notes. But um, yeah, the thing about the life course, we did I did actually test run some tests across the across adolescence at least with our morality reports in the study. And it is found to be rising at a relatively stable rate. So rising in that we found that when um, major life events occurred um, in sort of uh, you know, around age 16, 17, 18, uh, such as getting a full-time job, for example, or getting a long-term partner or having a child. Those things seem to um, seem to steadily kind of increase morality across that adolescent period. And I would imagine there will be a point um, at the kind of early 20s where that would sort of level off as people kind of become adults and, and live their adult lives. But um, obviously, there, like I like I showed there, there's just so much variation in that. Uh, this is we're talking about a small handful of people here who have particularly especially weak morality and that seems to be consistent across the, the number of years so um, my thinking on this is that unless there is some sort of intervention so if it's not achieved in the early years through those primary agents um, unless there is some major life event or participation in a programme of some sort, then it, it's unlikely to magically strengthen because it's quite an inherent um, daily decision making tool, really. Thank you. Um, one other question. I'm just wondering with the, your prolific violent offenders, what, what um, age did they start to come into contact generally with the criminal justice system? Yeah, so um, what the way that we we met all the young 700 people when they were about age 11, um, the way that I sampled for that violent subsample was uh, based on the number of offences and, and the duration. So if they had reported 
a high number of offences in a number of our interview years, then those, those two things they were included. But the third thing was early age of onset because of the evidence that suggests that early age of onset um, offenders are, are, are more likely to continue um, committing crimes uh, later into their lives. And um, so a lot of the offenders in the sample had an age of onset of um, reporting crimes before age 12. Um, and I mean, I think I think it's important to say that I mean, of those of those um, interviews, some. I, the, one of the first questions was, "When was the last time you were involved in 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 a violent event of some sort?" And for some people, that was. I, I think the earliest or the most recent was actually the day before. Um, and for lots of them, it was you know last week or two weeks ago. Um, so so we we are talking about a group of people here who it, it it felt that they reported that it was very habitual to them and um, came very uh, naturally to them to behave in that way. Brilliant. And I just have one more question. I'm just wondering for the um, policing practitioners in the audience, what your takeaway message would be for, for policing and for the other agencies, obviously, um, that um, are tasked with with uh, responding to violent crime. What, what's your takeaway message from the research you've done? I think um, I think it's very difficult to uh, to tackle something like this. Um, and I mean, I think at the moment, uh, to my knowledge, there there are no major programs um, that are that are seeing morality as the as the forefront of, of what should be covered. So I think my answer to that would be in as many channels as possible. So I mentioned earlier on if there's any police work going on in schools, that I think that would be an excellent place to start with um, in some way. Um, and, and I think um, sort of uh, hypothetical scenarios and moral dilemmas are an excellent way of of trying to achieve that if there's uh, police work going on in schools discussing that sort of thing um and i mean i i i don't i don't have a a, a brilliant answer to that i'm afraid i'd be really keen to hear from um police officers who want to develop this further and and to perhaps share with me a few of the channels that they have access to that they that they think this could be a potential route for and i'd be very happy to attempt to try and input there where i can fantastic um well hopefully you will you will have some some emails i think it, it's it's really fascinating work nima so thank you very much um on behalf of us all at peer um for for joining us today um, if I could just take this opportunity um, while we're on the line just to advertise two of our upcoming events on the 28th of October sees the start of our public lecture series, um, which is around the theme of crime and policing in a pandemic, very topical. Um, and our first speaker is Professor Graham, Graham Farrell from Leeds University, who has been doing some really interesting work on how crime trends have changed um, during the lockdown. Um, so please do look out for that event. That's available to sign up on Eventbrite. And then the next in this series, um, this research seminar series, we will be um, welcoming our own uh, peers, very own PhD student and also Essex Police's uh, control room supervisor, Jo Trainer. She'll be speaking about her PhD research. Um, she's doing an ethnography of the police control room. So some really groundbreaking work going on um, that Joe's doing. So I do hope you'll be able to join us for some or both of these, uh, one or both of these events. And of course, please, if you have any feedback um, um, uh, on these events, we'd be delighted to hear from you. So once again, very many thanks, Nima, for your time today. Thanks to everyone for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.